Within the Imperium of Man, there exists a political elite that has tremendous power over the entire human race. They are a class of mutant nobility called Navigators. They have formed into a guild known as the Novice Nobolite. We've covered Navigators in previous 40 Facts video, but to give you a quick synopsis, these influential mutants are the only people that can peer into the warp and help ships ride the tumultuous waves of the Immaterium. Without the Novice Nobolite and their Navigators, the Imperium would cease to exist. Even the Imperial Inquisition tends to be careful in handling of individual Navigators due to the political power of the Novice Nobolite. And today, we will be diving deep into the lore of the leader of the Novice Nobolite, the Paternova. And with that said, I want to welcome you guys back to another 40 Facts about the 40k universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about Navigators. If you guys are new to the channel, we post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day. What I try to do is I create a 40 Facts video with a lore portion in the beginning, a hobby portion, and then a community portion where I answer the comments that you guys left off in the previous 40 Facts video. So if you guys have suggestions, questions about the universe, or just want to see me react to something going on in the 40k community just comment down in the comment section below and we'll talk about it tomorrow but with that said let's get into 40 facts on the paternova the paternova is the leader and the most powerful both in terms of psychic and political powers of all the navigators of the novice nobolite the paternova lives in the palace of the navigators which dominates the center of the navigator quarter on terra from the moment he or she is instilled, the Paternova never leaves this place. The staff, soldiery, and other retainers of the Palace of the Navigators are all drawn from the Paternova's own house, and are all replaced with each new Paternova who assumes the office. And although the Paternova sits atop the Navigator's hierarchy, he or she is not a High Lord of Terra. The position is given over to the Paternova Envoy, a servant and a trusted advisor to the Paternova. It is the envoy that represents the interests of the Novice Nobolite and the Senatorum Imperialis. To understand the chief role of the Paternova, we must first understand their ability to somehow amplify the warp sense of other navigators. This is a direct result of the extreme mutations a Paternova suffers during their ascension from being one of the heirs apparent found amongst all the navigators of the most powerful navigator houses. For this reason, the Paternova is sometimes described as the guiding father or mother of the novice Nobolite, whose powers transcend the warp itself. The importance of this link is demonstrated during the rare interregnum that periodically occurs between the reign of one Paternova and their replacement. During this time, all navigators, other than the heirs apparent, suffer a considerable reduction in their ability to navigate the warp. If this state of affairs were to continue for long, much of the Imperium would collapse into anarchy, as both commercial and military Imperial starships would be unable to quickly and safely traverse the warp, with many being lost to the Immaterium completely. Luckily, Paternovas can often live for a thousand standard years. When they do die, however, their successor is chosen from amongst the waiting heirs apparent, the most powerful navigators of all the great families. From the moment of their death, all of the existing heir apparents undergo a dramatic physical metamorphosis. They grow larger and stronger, and the psychic mutations that categorize all navigators become even more pronounced. The heir apparents gain the ability to survive underwater, in poisonous environments, and even in the hard vacuum of space. Their natural aggression is increased, and they are drawn into combat with each other. As each heir apparent is slain, those who survive change physically even more, until only one remains alive. It is this vastly changed and extremely powerful individual who becomes the new Paternova. As soon as a new Paternova is instilled within the Palace of the Navigators, all of the other Navigators find the standard strength of their own psychic abilities restored, though not all are all restored to the same degree or effectiveness. Those Navigators belonging to the same house of the Paternova find their abilities greatly enhanced, as if though their blood ties enables the Paternova to transmit their powers more effectively to their kin. Navigators belonging to the house of the older Paternova lose this benefit, and many Navigators suddenly find their powers greatly diminished. The reason for this alteration in power levels remains unknown to Imperial genetic scientists. And that is another quick little lore bit on the Paternova. Again, sorry that I'm not posting longer lore videos. The sickness is really weird. Like, I was really, like, sick before with just a regular cold, but now it just seems like, like my throat and, like, my headache won't go away. 
Uh, so I cough every now and then, but like there's a lingering pain in the back of my throat. That's really annoying. Maybe I should go check to see if I have strep or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but that's kind of why I haven't been able to, to post. Uh, just the energy has been drained out of my body just because it's like constant pain. Uh, for this hobby portion of the video, I think I'm just going to do a quick little showcase of the Hexmark Destroyer that I painted for my friend in yesterday's video. I didn't get to show you guys the finished product, so here it is. And now let's move on to the community portion of the video where I answer the questions that you guys left off in yesterday's 40 facts video, the 40 facts and lore on the Necron Overlord Imotech versus Black Templar Marshall Hellbrick. That title is long. Um, if you guys have more questions for me, or if you guys would like me to react to a certain comment, just, you know, leave it down in the comment section below, and we'll talk about it in tomorrow's video. But let's get into the comments. Mr. Flibble says, Imotech versus Black Templar Marshall Helbrick, essentially, it's about family. Yeah, uh, that, that has been a growing TikTok trend, um... It, it was funny at first because it's like poking fun of um, Vin Diesel and like his whole little thing, um, but now it's it, now it's I think the 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 meme is kind of going off away from the whole um, Fast and the Furious like goofiness with the family and stuff like that. Um, but anyways, um, next question comes from Hatchetfish Blue. Hello again. Uh, an orc question for you today. When it comes to the orc language, how do you actually speak to one another? Or how do they actually speak to one another? The majority of species can speak and or understand low gothic. And this question was actually posed by my mother when watching the fan-made Hell's Reach movie. But the orcs roar, grunt, snarl, scream, and yet understand each other perfectly. It is something to do with wog. Or is it something to do with wog energy? Or do what we perceive as different unintellig unintelligible noises slash shouts and shrieks actually translate into a proper orc language. Uh, kind of like wog noises, uh, then growling means umis this way, bring daka. Or one continuous wog bellowing sound noise translates through the psychic powers of the wog energy into a, an exact same sentence, or the exact same sentence. I may not have explained this clearly as I would have liked but it was a conundrum that no wiki or forum could assist me with. Thanks again for um, taking the time to read all of this. No problem. And that's actually a really good question. Now, to answer the question, um, yes, orcs, uh, speaking low gothic, that's like their main um, uh, language. Whenever GW posts a trailer for like Dawn of War or, um, um, you know, any of the new stuff that's going to come out for the Warhammer Plus, um, they speak in that like umi this way is kind of uh, talk um, and if you pull up the old school codex like this is the uh, orcs uh, fifth edition codex i think it was uh, they actually have a page with a bunch of orc glyphs so the orcs actually even have their own um, words for certain things um, so scragga um, that that means like ard boy or a veteran uh, what's another one here uh, Waza, that means uh, speed. Um, war means uh, weird. Uh, so there's like a bunch of little, like weird ways to say uh, certain things, kind of like slang for the orcs. But they, spill, they still speak low gothic. Um, now, when you see in Hell's Reach or any other movie an orc war boss like growl, grunt, uh, snarl, do something like that, and then the orcs kind of understand. It is because of not so much like a, a set language, but just like when you're around a certain group, you catch on to certain nonverbal or very like primitive verbal um, uh, ways of communicating. Uh, I've noticed that like even with my siblings, like certain uh, grunts like hmm or, or like huh, like, like things like that 
the way you you grunt or say something it means a certain type of thing kind of like when you're trying to structure a sentence uh and you put kind of like an emphasis like is, is this right um that implies that it's a question grunts are kind of the same for orcs like um you, you know a certain a certain roar or a certain grunt uh means like i'm pissed get out of my way or like uh, don't go that way or something like that, but it's not like um, It's not something found in the codex or in the books. It's just something that I think every single race does uh, Inadvertently like if you're around a certain group for so long kind of like the orcs are with their tribes uh, You pick up on these nonverbal and very primitive cues uh, That develop through just like interacting and stuff like that now, I wish I could be clearer because I don't really know the, the exact words for this. Uh, so if anybody knows a little bit more about like um, nonverbal communication and stuff like that, um, you know, help me out in the comment section below. Uh, but grunts, roars, hisses, things like that, um, they still communicate a language uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that like it's, it's wog energy. It's just the way living things communicate. It's like, you know, cats hiss, purr, things like that. Orcs do kind of something similar, just like humans do and stuff like that. Uh, again, I hope that makes sense, um, but that's a really good question. Um, and yeah, I actually really tried to get into the um, the whole glyphs of the orcs. And when I was building terrain for um, my orcs, I would draw these little like symbols and try to make sentences and stuff like that. Uh, but after a while, it just... It looks like random squiggles um, or scribbles. So, yeah. Uh, next question comes from Magos Dominus. If you could delete any character from the 40k universe, who would you get rid of? I think I would want to get rid of like a big, um, <laughs> uh, like important person so that it can make a huge change in the 40k universe. Huh. And, and the only one that comes to mind... The Sound Alchemist is going to hate me for this, but Farsight. I think Farsight kind of, like, kills the whole uh, greater good thing um, because it's like, oh, these guys are separatists from the greater good. Like, I, I want the Tau to be straight-up space communists, um, you know, like, building caste system, and everybody follows the rule because of social um, uh, discipline or social engineering and stuff like that. Uh, none of this, like, the Dawn Blade and breaks the Ethereal's curse and all this kind of junk. So, yes, uh, Commander Farsight I would kill or get rid of. Um, also, like, I don't, I wouldn't play that faction. So, if I, if, or when I become a Tau player in the future, uh, I'm not going to play the Farsight Enclaves. I'm probably going to play um, the Sepid World of Tau or something like that. Or create my own, probably create my own. Next question comes from Ian Harrison. You should do a video that would happen if of what would happen if the Imperium accepted the greater good. So I kind of already did with like what happens to humans when they enter the greater good because it's essentially the same thing. Uh, so I'll put a link up above if you're interested in finding out, you know, what happens to Guaybesa basically. Link is up above. Uh, next question comes from Lauren Burnham. Excellent explanation of how artists grow, except those individuals that put what they think into any medium. Uh, Google, oh, I can't pronounce that, Beksinski. His dystopia realism kind of feels like he spent some time being depressed with Picasso before taking mushrooms with Salvador Dali, uh, but it's all inspired by the Nazi occupation of Poland and that that they targeted any Jew artist like a historical inquisition in the Spanish Inquisition. So perfect representation of chaos. Actually, I think I know who you're talking about. I'm going to copy him. Uh, I'm going to copy this artist really quick and paste them just because it's very grim dark too. And I think it's come up on Instagram as like, yep, yep, images that you might like. I think I follow him on Instagram. Um, yeah, if that's not 40k... If that's not if that's not like grim dark 40k stuff like yeah yeah uh really awesome artist and it's weird too because he popped up in my uh recommended feel uh, like a week ago it's just weird that we're talking about him now um 
and he was actually influential on a lot of other Polish artists um, because when I was in Poland there's like a little like um, area in I think Gdansk where like you could walk around and see like different art and they have vendors and food and stuff like that and there was a lot of artists selling their their artwork and it had this vibe of like depression uh, gloominess grim darkness and stuff like that this the specific guy that I talked to I wish I remembered his name um, but he actually um, he said that he got a lot of inspiration from um, the old Aztec um, um, like art and stuff like that and I kind of I would kind of see it just because the patterns that he did were repeating and if you look at like old Aztec um, art or old Aztec um, what are those called etchings um, it's a lot of the same patterns repeating over and over again um, but I'm pretty sure he had influence from this guy too just because it, the, the the look looks so similar and for all those that don't know in in the previous video I was explaining how like most artists or in this situation like you said individuals in any medium um it's easy to accuse them that they're stealing from other uh sources uh but that's how artists grow they mimic and then make their thing make these things their own and then um you know it grows um but yeah and those were the oh there's another one by dj sharky the man emperor of mankind's vox cat sent me here cool i'm glad you or um I hope you stay, um, and I don't know who the Emperor, the Man Emperor of Mankind's Vox cast is. So if anybody ever gives us a shout out or says anything, um, just put a link or let us know how we can find it so we can say thanks to them um, or anything like that. Um, but thank you guys for listening, and sorry for the short lore video. More good videos to come, uh, or more longer videos to come tomorrow. And, um, yeah, talk to you guys tomorrow. This is Gershwin with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>